from our Toronto studios. This is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Zahra Sayed. Our top story tonight. The Palestinian Health Ministry reports that Israeli attacks in the past 24 hours have killed 31 Palestinians and injured 56 others. The violence escalated as Israeli artillery struck a house in the Bourej refugee camp, leaving one dead and several wounded. Northern Gaza faces dire circumstances with thousands of civilians isolated without access to essential supplies following a week-long Israeli incursion. Israel has announced plans to escalate its ground invasion in southern Rafah, targeting areas with a high concentration of Palestinian civilians. Israeli forces report combat engagements in Jabalia's city center, claiming killing 60 fighters and discovering a weapons cache. In a concerning development, Israeli settlers allegedly set fire to an aid truck destined for Gaza, injuring the driver and soldiers. More than 600,000 people have fled Rafah and 100,000 from northern Gaza due to the ongoing attacks. Despite Israeli claims at the World Court of Aid Facilitation, the WHO highlights challenges in delivering medical supplies to Gaza amid the conflict. Any potential Israeli military rule in Gaza would cost Tel Aviv at least $5.4 billion annually, according to a document of the security establishment. At least 35,303 people have been killed and 79,261 wounded in Israeli attacks on Gaza since October 7th. Israel is accused of genocide at the International Court of Justice. The court ordered Tel Aviv to ensure its forces do not commit acts of genocide and take measures to guarantee that humanitarian assistance is provided to the civilians in Gaza. The International Court of Justice, or the ICJ, has reserved its decision following a two-day hearing on South Africa's petition urging Israel to halt its ground invasion of Gaza's Rafah city. Tensions ran high as proceedings were interrupted when a woman from the public gallery shouted liars at the Israeli legal team. The ICJ posed a critical question to Israel regarding the humanitarian conditions in Gaza's evacuation zones. Judge George Nolte asked Israel to provide details on the safety and aid provisions in these zones with a written response due by Saturday. It has also asked South Africa to present a written counter to Israeli arguments by Monday. South Africa's legal team, led by Ambassador Vusi Muzi Madonsila, argues that Israel's actions in Gaza amount to genocide. They highlighted severe humanitarian issues, including widespread killings, a crippled health system, and mass graves due to targeted attacks on hospitals. Israel's Deputy Attorney General Jalad Noam defended the country's actions, claiming they are in response to attacks from Hamas. He accused South Africa of distorting facts and seeking to aid Hamas. Rafah in particular is a focal point for ongoing terrorist activity. It is a stronghold for Hamas's operatives with several battalions belonging to the Rafah brigades entrenched in the area. If anybody should be told that enough is enough, it is truly South Africa and not Israel. At what point do we say enough to South Africa's repeated attempts to exploit the provisional measure procedure of this court in such a vile and cynical manner? Tamar Kaplan Turjiman from Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs also countered South Africa's claims. Mr. President, members of the court, there is no doubt that this war is tragic and has caused great suffering on both sides. Again, this is Hamas's doing. South Africa provides an account that is not only in, in a Incredible, and incredibly partial, it is also distorted. He claimed that Israel allows aid through various crossings and blamed Palestinian militants for the conflict's suffering. However, the WHO countered this argument, saying it has not been able to get any medical supplies into the enclave since Israeli troops moved towards Rafah. WHO spokesperson Tarek Jasarevic said the last medical supplies entered Gaza before May 6th. The court's decisions on provisional measures remains pending, with ongoing debates about the legal and humanitarian aspects of the Gaza conflict. The Arab League has formally proposed deploying United Nations peacekeeping forces in Gaza and the West Bank until a two-state solution is achieved. 
The call made during a summit in Bahrain demands the United Nations Security Council set a timeline for the peace process. However, actual deployment faces hurdles, including Security Council approval and consent from Israel and Palestinian factions. The UN Secretary General has endorsed the two-state solution as a sole path to ending violence. Meanwhile, the United States has expressed concerns over the proposal, fearing it could impact Israel's security strategy. The Arab League reiterated the pre-1967 borders as the basis for the solution and urged the Council to act swiftly. Talks for a ceasefire in Gaza face complexities, with ongoing debates on governance and prisoner exchanges in the aftermath of the war. In defiance of President Joe Biden's veto threat, 16 House Democrats joined 208 Republicans to pass the Israel Security Assistance Support Bill. The bill, introduced by Representative Ken Calvert, aims to ensure the delivery of defense weapons to Israel, countering Biden's efforts to withhold resources. The vote 224 to 187 saw three GOP members opposing it and six Republicans, along with 13 Democrats not voting. The Democrats supporting the bill include Representatives Matt Cartwright, Angie Craig and Henry Quiller. Criticism emerged from groups like the Institute for Middle East Understanding Policy Project, condemning the move as disregarding human rights law. Justice Democrats labeled supporters as fringe extremists. If passed in the Senate, it could set up a showdown with the White House. The Council on American-Islamic Relations is suing Governorate Greg Abbott and two Texas university systems for violating students' First Amendment rights. The Muslim Civil Rights Group claims Abbott's executive order on anti-Semitism aims to silence Palestinian activists. The suit targets Abbott, the University of Texas system, and the University of Houston system. Abbott's order, prompted by pro-Palestinian protests, mandates updates to campus free speech policies. While Abbott's office condemns anti-Semitism, critics argue the order restricts free expression. Institutions like the University of Houston amended policies to align with state definitions of anti-Semitism. Abbott has also mandated punishments, including expulsion for anti-Semitic acts, raising concerns over constitutionally protected speech. Kerr asserts that the order suppresses dissenting views. Renowned Israeli historian Ilan Pape, a vocal critic of Zionism, was detained and interrogated by FBI agents upon his arrival at Detroit Metropolitan Airport. He was questioned for two hours about his views on Hamas, Israeli actions in Gaza, and his relationships with Arab and Muslim friends in the United States. Pape, who detailed the encounter in a Facebook post, noted that while the agents were not abusive, their questions were perplexing. After a lengthy phone call, presumably with Israeli authorities, and copying data from his phone, Pape was allowed to enter the country. The interrogation has sparked outrage amongst Palestinian advocates. University of California, Berkeley professor Osama Makdisi and commentator Arnaud Bertrand criticized the incident as part of a broader pattern of intimidation against critics of Israel. Pape, a scholar at the University of Exeter, is known for his extensive work on Palestinian history, including his book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. His latest book, Lobbying for Zionism on Both Sides of the Atlantic, examines the influence of pro-Israel lobbying groups. The ACLU's Jamil Dakwar questioned whether Pape's detention was related to his anti-genocide activism and his recent publications. Pakistan's first free Palestine sit-in launches at Khayyad e Azam University. Details come after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Pakistan's Made in Free Palestine sit-in, orchestrated by the student body, was inaugurated at qaeda e azam University in the capital Islamabad. The event, positioned near the Central Library, serves as a platform for students to advocate for Palestine through art, slogans, and music. Organizers demand Pakistan's government offer diplomatic and political backing to Palestine, including aid corridors and UN condemnation of Israel's actions. Students are also calling for increased scholarships and educational initiatives on Palestinian history. Inspired by global movements, the sit-in aims to garner support nationally and internationally. 
participants have voiced solidarity with Palestinians and criticized nations like Germany for their alleged complicity in Israel's actions. Organizers emphasize their commitment to historical justice, standing against global powers' indifference to Palestinian suffering. The sit-in follows recent protests against the German ambassador's perceived hypocrisy in the city of Lahore. Former President Donald Trump's purported $1 billion election year offer to major oil executives, if accepted, could generate a significant windfall. According to Friends of the Earth Action, Trump's offer involves campaign funding from oil companies repaid with deregulation and tax relief upon his election. This will result in a $110 billion profit for these corporations. Democrats led by Representative Jamie Raskin are investigating these quid pro quo allegations. Critics argue that Trump's promises of tax cuts and debt payment could worsen the national debt, as seen in the GOP's 2017 tax cuts. With the possibility of Republicans making these cuts permanent, oil and gas companies could greatly benefit. Analysts say the investigation underscores concerns over corruption and highlights the stakes for climate action and progressive causes. The United States has banned 26 Chinese textile firms because of forced labor concerns in relation to Uyghurs. The goods produced by them, which include cotton traders and warehouse facilities within China, will be restricted from entering the United States effective May 17th. The Department of Homeland Security said 21 of the companies source and sell cotton from East Turkestan, known in China as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, on the wholesale market. Secretary of Security Alejandro Marikas said the United States will not tolerate forced labor in supply chains. Since the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was signed in December 2021, the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force chaired by the DHS has added 65 entities to the law's entity list. China's northwestern region is home to 10 million Uyghurs, as the Turkic Muslim group makes up 45% of its population. The Supreme Court has ruled that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB's funding structure, is constitutional, rejecting claims it violated the Appropriations Clause. Established after the 2008 financial crisis, the CFPB ensures fairness in consumer financial markets. The case challenged the CFPB's unique funding mechanism, which is funded by a percentage of Federal Reserve earnings, arguing it's lacked congressional oversight. The Community Financial Services Association of America Limited argued that the CFPB lacked the necessary congressional oversight to comply with the Appropriations Clause. Justice Clarence Thomas authored the decision, starting it met the criteria of the appropriation made by the law. The CFPB hailed the ruling as a victory for consumers and fair markets, vowing to continue its crucial work. CFPB advocate Senator Elizabeth Warren lauded the decision as a win for the working class. Researchers at MIT have identified what they believe to be the three of the oldest stars in the universe. They are thought to have emerged during the early stages of galaxy formation 12 to 13 billion years ago, around the time when the first galaxies were taking shape. Using data collected from the Magellan Clay Telescope in Chile, researchers analyzed the stars' spectra to determine their chemical composition and the age. Researchers characterized the stars based on their low abundances of certain chemical elements, such as strontium and barium. Located in the Milky Way's halo, the cloud of stars surrounding the main galactic disk, the stars are referred to as SAS stars, or small accredited stellar system stars. The discovery is expected to offer significant insights into the early stages of galaxy formation and the evolution of the universe. Signed into law on March 25th, it aims to prevent the fraudulent sale of foods falsely labeled as halal. Signed into law on March 25th, it aims to prevent the fraudulent sale of foods falsely labeled as halal. Sponsored by State Senator Claire Wilson and local members of the Islamic Center of Federal Way, the act prohibits the knowing misrepresentation of halal foods. Muhammad Nazir, representing the Islamic Center, emphasized the significance of halal preparation, noting that improper practices invalidate the meat for Muslim consumption. Previously, sellers faced no repercussions for selling fake halal meat, causing distress amongst Muslim communities. The act aims to address this issue, providing legal recourse for consumers. Nazir, instrumental in advocating for the bill, hopes to continue supporting the Muslim community and fostering interfaith dialogue in the future.
He said that locally, some people were selling meats and foods and labeling them as halal to sell to Muslims. Nazir said some people were even selling pork and saying it was beef or another meat. Although beef is permissible if it is halal, pork is never permissible for Muslims. That's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates. Your support is needed more than ever to continue our mission of providing informative, educational and inspiring content to Muslims in North America and around the world. Donate now by visiting muslimnetwork.tv donate. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.